Welcome, everyone, to today's devotion. We're in Acts chapter 4, and here the conflict with the religious elites uh, in these early chapters really starts to get stirred. It it, it, it starts in chapter 3 with the healing of the uh, the man, but now uh, their popularity is increasing. So we start in verse 1 of chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Luke's going to emphasize that suffering does not, um, does not limit the reach of the gospel. It may actually extend the reach of the gospel. This is, again, something that American Christians are missing. We think that unless we have our system in place, our traditions in place, unless the culture recognizes and, and respects that, then um, the gospel can't move forward. You read Acts. They're, they're never accepted. In fact, what you find is wherever Christianity goes, it, it, it interrupts the system. And, and the problem comes when, is when Christianity is the system or, or, or presumed to be the system because Christianity starts to lose its salt and light. Um, and at some point, this culture is going to bottom out. You, you cannot know the difference between male and female, among other crazy things, without there being a falling out. You cannot have the uprooting of the homes and the empowerment of governments and keep it that way for long. There will be a bottoming out. But where there is Christianity, and when it enters into a city or a community or a culture or a country, it will interrupt that. And when it interrupts, there will be blowback. And Peter and John are experiencing that here. So um, they're standing before the, the high priest and the Sanhedrin and all that. Verse 7, uh, by what power or by what name did you do this? Right? They, they healed the man there at the beautiful gate. Verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. There that is again. Don't miss how important that is. Said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good day, good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and that's the emphasis in, 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 in Peter's preaching so far, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. Well, now you'll notice what he does here is he says, I am on trial for doing a good thing. And the day will come when Christians will stand trial for doing good things. In fact, all around the world, Christians are on trial for doing good things. Look, if the church is going to cause trouble, let it be because we're doing good things. Not because we're storming capitals or burning cities down. Let it be because we're doing good things. Not for nonsense we're sharing online, but for doing good things. That should be common sense, but... We're increasingly missing that, aren't we? This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. It's a, a, a quote from Psalm, a reference to the Psalm, quoted all over the New Testament following the resurrection. Uh, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Um, so there goes your coexist sticker, I guess. But nevertheless, um, you see here, they're saying, look, if I'm given an opportunity to speak, I will proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love that about Peter and his boldness. Verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, remember, at the end of Luke and Matthew and Mark, Peter was recognized as being one of the disciples of Jesus, and he was embarrassed. Now he's recognized as being one of the original disciples of Jesus, and he boldly proclaims the, the, the hope we have in Jesus. What a change. What, what changed in Peter? It was repentance and faith and the gift of the Spirit given to him as a, as, as a result of his salvation. What a change that makes and should make in, in, in all of us. Uh, but, of course, they write him off because he's uneducated. And this has been the history of Christianity, isn't it? It happens right now. If you tell people about Jesus with a southern accent, you're written off. You know, um, but this has been the pattern from the, from, from the very beginning. Jesus faced this, right? Verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, this, is, this is incredible. Look, we'll let you go. Just um, don't talk about it ever again. I mean, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous suggestion. 
But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. What we have here is a great approach to civil disobedience. Notice that when it comes to civil disobedience, it is peaceful and it must be centered on the hope we have in Christ. Not the hope we have in a document, or hope we have in traditions, a hope we have in, in our politics, but the hope that we have in Christ. So basically when it comes to civil disobedience, we do it when the government asks us to do something the Bible tells us not to, or tells us not to do something the Bible tells us to do. So in the uh, example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're told to do something, bow down to, to, an, uh, to a false idol, that the Bible says not to. Peter and John are asked not to do something, proclaim the hope of Christ, that the Bible clearly tells them to do. But you notice they are peaceful, and they are willing to suffer whatever the consequences might be for the sake of conscience and for the sake of, of obedience to Christ. Well, I want to skip down to verse 32 because this is going to play a role in the next chapter. We got a hint of this at the end of chapter 2 where uh, you get that vignette of the early church. It was worship, fellowship, discipleship, and charity. Remember that? And so we see an emphasis on the charity part. Now, the point of this is to give us another vignette at the local church. So while all these things are, are happening, Peter and John are in prison, and there, there are people still gathering for worship despite that. Um, and that's what Luke is showing us. But he's also introducing the next narrative, which we'll see in detail tomorrow, and that's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Um, so verse 32, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Notice, it's the opposite of Babylon. In Babylon, unity comes by uniformity. Here, unity comes by diversity. Okay. Uh, and so they're sharing everything. This is fellowship and charity. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sowed, laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sowed a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So our introduction to Barnabas, and uh, he's an early convert. And he is going to play an important role, particularly in the story of Paul. Um, and uh, so, so we'll save that for later, but he's just introduced here. But what Luke is really doing, remember that the chapter breaks aren't inspired by God. They were added later by translators and editors and publishers. So what you have here is, is this vignette about charity within the church is then attached to what happens when there is deceit and evil in the church. And so what you have in Ananias and Sapphira is a couple who, perhaps out of jealousy, um, want to be perceived in the same light that Joseph Barnab uh, Barnabas was, um, and therefore say that they were uh, very generous, but in fact were very greedy. Um, and so we're going to see that contrast more tomorrow. The main thing here is, is I don't think the Bible is promoting socialism or communism or anything like that. Um, but the main point is, is that what they had in common was Christ. And if Christ is everything, then they have everything in common. Let me ask you, how charitable are you, particularly with other believers in Christ? Are you stingy? And if so, what does that say about your theology? Hope to see you guys here tomorrow.